Alrighty, let's get well. Let's get into things. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival 2023. Welcome to those of us joining on Zoom, including those throughout New South Wales who are watching from your local library. We would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation as the traditional owners of this land and pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. We are Flex and Herds of local Sydney radio show Death of the Reader on 2SER 107.3 and we are delighted to welcome you to the Metcalf Auditorium for this discussion with Michelle Prack, author of The Rush, Michael Trant, author of No Trace and Benjamin Stevenson of everyone on this train is a suspect. We're gonna be having a little chat about closed circle murder mysteries and what to do when you know the murderer is inside the building. Firstly, a few short housekeeping announcements. Please mute your mobile phones and do not record the session. We would love to see you taking photos, but please no flash photography. Unless you're the official photographer, of course. Of course, there's an <laughs> exception there. Uh, feel free to share uh, on social media at Bad Crime Sydney. Hashtag bad crime Sydney. We will have about 10 minutes for questions after the conversation. If you're joining us via Zoom, please send your questions through using the chat function. Chat is capitalized, it's very important. About 20 minutes before the end of the session, and we'll be keeping an eye out to include you in the discussion. With all of that out of the way, let's get into the stabby bits. <clears throat> so let's start by asking each of you to define not your characters, your plot, your crime, all those terribly unimportant things, but the circle itself in your novel and why you have chosen it. Let's start with Michelle. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I feel like I'm in a crime writers festival and a FM radio studio. <laughs> so two for the price of one. It's fantastic. Uh, my closed circles, I guess you could say there are two. One of them is a car with four young people traveling from Adelaide to Darwin. Another circle, quite cozy, is um, an outback pub called the Pindery. Eventually, um, those two um, collide, as mm. you can imagine. Cool. And uh, Benjamin, tell us about your circle. Yeah, my circle is a straight line. It's a train from Darwin to Adelaide, the GAN, um, where a crime writing festival is taking place and they become trapped on it. Um, and there's sort of bushfires in the distance so the helicopters can't get to them. So they really have no choice but to ride the train to Adelaide mm. with a killer on board. Now, the, the GAN is a real train that I believe has a trademark at the end of it. Did you, do you have to navigate much to get that through? Does it have a trademark? I, I thought it did. It? Well, I mean, it's fiction. I mean, you know, you don't you don't have to sort of trademark when you talk about Sydney Opera House or the Eiffel Tower. It, it's a good time to bring that up, given that they've just printed all the copies of it and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, the GAN, so Journey Beyond is the company that runs the GAN and they've read the book. So we sent it to them. And I think I thought when we sent it to them, it was to sort of check that we weren't going to get sued or anything. But uh, they emailed back and they said, we love it. This is great. Could you come on board? And so I get to go on the train as well. Oh, that's so fantastic. I think we've avoided that, but I wasn't aware of the copyright. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you, Benjamin, I have a bone to pick with you because ever since I read your book, uh, the internet, mostly YouTube, has been sending me ads for the GAND nonstop for several weeks now. That's good. That's good. good to hear. <laughs> I need you to well, tell them to stop. It's better than my second book. I'm so sorry. I'm, in, I'm talking over the top of your, your chance to talk about your closed circle. Um, but I will say um, it's better that you're getting ads for the GAN because my second novel before the Everyone in My Family, is the Everyone series, um, was called Either Side of Midnight and it was about a suicide that might be a murder. And all I got were ads just, just said, don't do it. Don't do it. Lifeline, <laughs> Beyond Blue, think about it. Uh, and so it's nice to see that you're getting good ads instead of those. Good ads, as if there was a good ad. Well, in any case, uh, Michael, why don't you tell us about your, your circle? Uh, yeah, uh, my circle is quite a big one. It's on about a half million hectare cattle station. Um, and I did not know it was a closed circle until my publisher told me. I've written a really good closed circle locked room mystery. I went, have I? Cool, because the actual locked room part of it didn't come in until halfway through my manuscript. I thought, well, why wouldn't you just call the cops in? So I needed a reason why you wouldn't. So basically there's a big low pressure system comes down, the cattle station floods, there's no in or out, which happens all the time when you're on those sort of properties. You see it on the news all the time. So, yeah, a bunch of tourists turn up, um, they all get locked there, dead body turns up, is it or isn't a murder? And, yeah, so the, lock, the locked room is quite big. But within that, there's another locked room with a homestead because what happens when it rains out in those places, you generally don't leave because it's all red dirt country. And um, once it gets wet, you can't go anywhere. You just get bogged and horribly stuck. So you generally 
blocked around the homestead doing all the chores around the house that haven't been done forever. And I know my father-in-law, he, that happened to him back when I was still on a sheep station. He said to me, one day if I have to put up another bloody curtain, I am going to go mad. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my lock circle. So closed circle murder mysteries often force characters to consider those closest to them as the culprit. And that's sort of something that runs between all three of these books. Michelle, you have, you know, relationships distrusting of each other. You do as well uh, with Ernest and Juliet. And then uh, Gabe also suspects Heidi in No Trace. So how do you play with the double-edged sword of trust among suspects in your writing? Benjamin, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. The, the thing about the familiarity between characters is is and the beauty of locked room mysteries is getting a set of people putting them somewhere and seeing what they do to each other under tension and maybe in that way maybe you don't even know sort of who the victim's going to be at the start of of my novel um i'm sort of playing them all as suspects for the characters in the book but also for the readers and my first book was at a family reunion where they started picking each other off so they had all these backstories between them and these levels of trust and issues that could be unpacked as they find a serial killer among them. The second book is a bunch of people who have never met, who get on the train at Darwin and then become very close very quickly by virtue of surviving the trip. So playing with levels of trust is very interesting because you get different, it's very different when they know each other and when they don't. But Ernest is on the train with his girlfriend, Juliet. And Ernest, for those who've read my books, he really loves murder mysteries and he loves the rules to murder mystery and one of the things that i do in my books is they're books in which someone who loves murder mysteries finds themselves inside a murder mystery he's trying to apply all the rules and one of the rules that he applies is that his girlfriend can't be a suspect she's exempt from being a suspect so he's investigating this murder in the novel and he's consciously saying to the reader it can't be her no it can't be her she's a returning character returning characters are never the killer in a golden age mystery it can't be her and he keeps ruling her out but we as the reader are sort of drawn along into this well why does he keep ruling her out so it gives you an extra level of tension there playing with the rules i believe the phrase is only an idiot would suspect juliet and i'm sure that isn't foreshadowing of the the worst moment in the entire book emotionally <laughs> well absolutely so he <laughs> says he says juliet can't be a suspect only an idiot would suspect juliet but then he's trying to have a romantic conversation with her i won't spoil it but he's trying to have a romantic conversation with her and she says, oh, I missed you last night. And he said, I missed you too last night. Where were you? And then <laughs> he's like, you know, so I'm playing with that kind of, you know, who do you bring in? But again, you know, it's a group of new people that have just met. And I think there are very interesting connections there and people who have connections that they don't know that they have. And you can discover that. So it's interesting whether you have everybody familiar or whether you introduce a brand new set. Yeah, and then Michelle, in your book, one of the things that's interesting is that you sort of have both of those things that Benjamin's just been talking about there in one. You have the people at the Pindari meeting, like the two lock closed circles essentially meet each other in the middle. Yes. Yeah, there's lots of um, trust circles, more circles. Um, I like looking at trust in um, my work because there's a lot of tension there. Uh, we, there's a lot to explore. Uh, with the four young people in the car, we have a, a couple that have been um, that share a house that they've been in, in a relationship for a number of years. Uh, and to share the cost of fuel, they go into a travel forum online and to find two backpackers to travel with them. So there's already um, some trust there, you know, trust in the travel forum, trust in this is a routine that a lot of people go through. Um, you travel together, this is a trustworthy event. Um, but of course, then, as um, you've mentioned, you've got I've got those four characters um, thrown in um, together in um, an almost inescapable um, situation in the car as well. I often think when we talk about outback journeys, uh, we might describe it as an, a great escape. It's um, getting out of the everyday ordinary. Let's um, get away from the office and, and get out amongst it but in reality for a lot of it you are actually confined in a fast moving vehicle you might be more stationary than you are during your everyday work and um, so I had a lot of fun in testing the um, unraveling trust or the um, the characters themselves sounding each, each other out but as you've mentioned at the Pindery that outback pub one of the things I loved exploring there from that female publican point of view was the trust you have to have in your own safety as a woman 
um, in, a, in an environment where emergency services or help might be far away. One of the things that the public in Andrea has to trust in quite often is um, civility and manners and societal norms. So for example, if you're a customer at the pub, you stay on that side of the bar, I'm on this side of the bar. If you're rowdy and I want to um, chuck you out, you have to leave. But um, throughout the rush, those sort of scenarios uh, get tested, that sort of trust gets tested. So Michael, in your book, Gabe, he's, he's a returning character and uh, from, from your previous book, Wild Dogs. And you play a lot with the idea that maybe Gabe trusts these people too much in a way. He's not even sure whether it's a murder mystery or not until like right at the end. But I, I feel like he almost, the person he doesn't trust is himself. There's this element of paranoia after his traumatic experience. He's a very, uh, a very traumatized professional on the job. I guess I'm curious about how you kind of approach uh, Gabe and his trustworthiness of his own, his own testimony in that moment. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to explore in No Trace, and Ben touched it on, you touched it on with um, everyone on a, is a suspect, is that you get these characters, they're always returning, whether it's Jack Reacher or all these other characters over 20 odd books, and they go and kill a heap of blokes in the in a book, and in the next book, he has a cup of tea and carries on. Like, it's, there's, there's no, which is fine if you're an SAS soldier or, or an investigative policeman, you've got those the training and stuff to deal with that. But Gabe's just a normal bushy. He's just a dog trapper. He works out in the Murchison trapping dingoes and wild dogs on the fence. And he, in wild dogs, he uncovers a people smuggling operation and ends up killing about 12 blokes to get himself out of trouble. Um, not by choice. He just sort of, that's what he had to do to survive. So for you and me, normal people, that's going to be a lot to unpack. So we've, in No Trace, we find him it's two years afterwards, he's basically been through the whole police investigation and everything, and he's starting to get nervous that he's probably upset quite a few very nasty people. So he's hiding out in a mate's cattle station, just keeping his head down. So when all these people turn up and things just start going wrong, and he's since learned that one of the guys is out of jail now because it, they couldn't get him on very, on very much, mainly because there was no witnesses left, thanks to Gabe, um, he starts wondering, well, am I, is everything that goes wrong in that book is completely explainable like the phone goes out the internet goes out that happens all the time on remote properties um helicopter falls out the sky that happens all the time too with these little mustering choppers they're always falling out of the sky just due to the nature of the work that they do so when these things start happening first of all he's like oh that's just run a bad luck but then the bad luck keeps happening and then when finally someone turns up dead it's like well is it bad luck is someone out to get him so all the characters that are there it could be any one of them or it could be none of them so that's a lot of Gabe's paranoia. And I mean, I didn't even know who was going to do it until the end. I still hadn't decided. And one of the people I had pegged to be the bad guy ended up saving the day. So it was just as much a mystery. Frank. Buddy Frank. <laughs> he's the best character. So I love him so much. Fucking Frank. Yeah, no, he was, he's a good character. But I, um, I wasn't sure what was going to happen either. So it made it easier for me because the discussions I was having in my head about, well, could this happen? That's the discussion that the characters have happening in the book. So once I decided who it was going to be, I could then go back and throw in all the little, um, you know, the little foreshadowings and whatever that made it look like I knew what I was doing when I was writing yeah. it to start with. Um, so, yeah, but that's that was essentially what the main thing was. I just don't want Gabe, I do not want Gabe to be this character that kills a heap of people, goes through all this traumatic stuff and then is fine because that's just not right. It's interesting hearing you talk, and I agree with that about the the sort of PTSD that affects these characters. Ernest in the book says, well, Miss Marple doesn't have nightmares, you know, and it's sort of reflecting on the fact they can just pick it up again. It's really interesting to me that your second novel unpacks Gabe's PTSD because I don't think this is a spoiler for the first novel, but he's not looking... I mean, I thought he was dead at the end of the first book. So how did you decide... That's interesting to me, not to like take the interview question, but I'm fascinated that you transformed a character who you'd all but I thought killed off into this kind of processing of what happened to him novel as your second book. Well, he did. The manuscript Penguin got for Wild Dogs, or Where Wild Dogs Roam, which is what it was called when I first sent it, he died. From the moment I started writing that story, I was going to have this grumpy old outback bushy, say, being paired up with someone not of his world and of his culture so he gets paired up with a young um, asylum seeker Af afghan man i mean um i wanted that clash of cultures but i wanted gabe to have this redemption arc where he dies at the end saving everyone else like all these movies that i've watched like the old logan movie logan all those movies where this grumpy old character who does not want to be there but still does the right thing 
So he did, he died. And then that's what they signed up for. We signed the contract, he was still dead. We did the first round of edits and got back, to, got to the last paragraph and he was still dead and the publisher said, does he have to die? <laughs> and they signed up for two books with Wild Dogs. And I, had, I had nothing like this, this was signed. It was signed up in September of 21, um, came out in February of 22 and they wanted the manuscript for the next book in June of 22. So I had nothing and I had four months to write this no trace. So by keeping Gabe around, it made life a bit easier because I already had so, the backstory, I already had a, a thing and then with no trace I could sort of delve into Gabe a bit more because he was going to die in Wild Dog so I didn't need to go into too much backstory with him and sort of set him up too much because he was, you just, all you had to know was just a grumpy old borderline alcoholic who was, didn't want to be where he was but had a, a unique set of skills that he could use to get himself out of trouble. So that was where the uh, title of the manuscript came from, is that if it showed up empty, there'd be no trace of it. For yeah, well, that, well, it was originally called <laughs> Slow Burn because he was, he was dealing with the, the, the first paragraph of Wild Dogs is the slow burn it gets them, and he's talking about drought. And droughts are, they are a slow burn, flies and floods, they all you know, happen so quick, you deal with it, and then you stress. Whereas a drought, it's a continued building, piling of each week upon week upon week, this slow burn of tension and pressure and... It's going to rain, no, it's not going to rain, the rain passes, you're spending money, so it's a slow burn. So that's what I wanted no trace to be, and that's Gabe's paranoia, building and building and building and building, so I called it slow burn. And then they decided to call it no trace, because through both books there's a leave no sign, leave no trace, which is what you've got to do when you're trying to trap wild dogs. And I thought, well, that's perfect, because when I write another book, I can call it no sign, and it'll be looking for someone. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the plan from now. Well, I mean, we all named our books after what our publishers were expecting when they got the draft. Mine would all be called "Sorry, It's Late." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I, know I did want to latch onto that idea of the uh, the redemption story, which is something that's really common in closed circle fiction, where everyone shows up, the circle gets closed around them, and they have to deal with this external trauma that they've brought in. So, for example, with you, Michelle, you have Andrea coming in with her trauma from her past and other jobs as a publican, and then Scott and Haley coming in with their relationship that they're dealing with, Livia coming in with this conflict about her ideals, and then you sort of the enigma in the story there. So I guess dealing with that redemption arc, how does that guide um, the boundaries of that closed circle for you, Michelle? Okay, I guess I was just looking at it from each character's point of view, having their own um, story um, to, to bring um, to uh, the novel. Um, and happily, as Michael said, I didn't know I was writing a <laughs> close um, circle um, book at all. Um, I guess that focus came naturally after many, many years, as, as many writers do and many people here, after many years of reading thrillers and reading crime and just imbibing it and having that sort of thing come out naturally. Um, I don't just like um, reading thrillers, I love watching them as well, so it feels like um, it's in the blood. And um, that redemption arc is um, another one of those expectations, I suppose. It's not quite a trope, but it's something that we enjoy um, in characters. Um, sometimes I think as well, this is very hard to discuss without um, giving spoilers because the rush does have a, a twist at the end. Sometimes you can almost pick um, a character's um, journey, predict what might happen, whether they're in the good basket or the bad basket, and mm -hmm. um, by that focus on their redemption, I suppose, and their, and their journey um, struggles. Are they struggling? Are they not struggling? Are they having a great time <laughs> or um, a poorer time? Are they reflecting um, or not? So, um, yeah, that's interesting, but not something I was really focused on. It just sort of came naturally. Because mm -hmm. one thing I found really interesting reading through your book is the way that you sort of emblemized this idea of the closed circle mystery by having pressure build when people are inside mm. and defuse when they're outside. So when the four of them are in the car, yeah. things are going wrong, they're getting into arguments, but they step yeah. outside and suddenly it's the beautiful landscape. Yeah. Um, you know, Andrea has all of these troubles when all of the bikies come into the pub, but as soon as they're all gone, as soon as everyone's outside, she can step onto the porch, things tend to cool off. So I guess, you know, that idea of space in the closed circle, was it important for you to deal with that physical pressure cooker idea of it as much as it was the sort of um, philosophical side of it, for lack of a better word? 
Yeah, I suppose it was um, letting the pressure valve down for the reader as well, you know, just um, allowing some of that space to leave <laughs> the um, confines of the car for a short time to, to get out of the um, pub and just have some sort of breathing space. And then there's contrast between so many anxious moments that there are throughout this book um, but you know in discussing this with you earlier it was remarkable to me that that inside versus outside is almost how I see the world myself like I am more happy and relaxed when I'm outside I'm going to be a heck of a lot more relaxed when I'm outside this room later on for example <laughs> um, but to me I am the kind of person that can't sit inside all day I do like to be out and that's and uh, you know to be in touch with nature um, so somehow that has drip fed um, into this book where, yeah, inside bad, outside good. <laughs> yeah, well, literally inside bad. Yeah, inside bad. <laughs> it's bad. Well, it's, you know, the I'm, work, I'm really, the drudge. I'm really interested in this, this dichotomy between inside and outside uh, in terms of the closed circle mystery. Um, characters in these sorts of stories tangle with the temptation that the danger comes from outside of the closed circle, regardless of the reader's knowledge otherwise, because we've read the back cover or reviews or we've read your previous work, you know, whatever it is. Um, how do you know when the time is right to unveil to your protagonist the true face of their foe? Well, because you go for it. Go for it. <laughs> run out of ideas and it's time to finish <laughs> the book. Um, no, I think that un unveiling for me, because I structure my books like golden age mysteries from the 1930s. So unveiling the true face of the foe is the end point in unveiling all of the goals and wants of everybody within the circle in this context on a train. So that's how I want to build my sort of red herrings is I want everybody to sort of have a goal and a want and a need. And the protagonist, the detective does not understand those goals and wants and needs, which is what makes them look like killers. Now those goals can be redemption. Those goals can be good. Those goals can be evil. They could be trying to hide something. They may not be trying to hide a murder, but they are trying to hide something. So the point in the book in which you unveil the foe is when you have unveiled all six of the goals and wants and needs and the only one left is the person whose goals and wants and need is a murder so that's kind of how i do it i i think that one of the things that i wanted to kind of try and do which i don't see all that much is that a lot of the times maybe you can unveil that once on the big red herring and then go through and then it's time to do the main one um but i wanted to do it for everybody i also think it's just it's just pace it's just when you need to there's only so many sort of um dominoes that you can set up right and there's a point where you've got to knock over the jenga tower and it's finding that's the skill right in in solving a murder mystery on the page it's finding the perfect moment to do that where you go uh, and here all it is, we're at maximum tension and uh, growing the tension, like you say about contrast, if you continue to add tension on tension, tension will become boring. So I've been a stand-up comedian for 15 years, right? You go and see a stand-up comedy act and they do 10 minutes and it's absolutely brilliant, right? If that stand-up comedian performs for you for an hour and does that six times, you're not going to like it because the structure of their sets, even if it's their absolute best material. So they need to put in pathos, contrast, pauses, pace, tension in different spaces. And so it's when you've built the tension so much that it, putting more tension on would only decrease the tension that you cut the wire and reveal the foe. But I or guess foes. One, of, one of the challenges in like the closed circle mystery sense is that we want to fair pl the play fair with the reader, which is something that you, Benjamin, have, have kindly put Knox and Van Dyne at the start of both of your previous books, much, much in my warm heart. Um, but that sort of leads you into the trap where the reader can get ahead of that pacing and structure. So how do you as an author make sure that you are both leaving clues, but also not just throwing out the readers who spot the twist coming? Well, absolutely. And I think that's a really delicate balance. And I think that's why uh, Golden Age mysteries are quite short. So, you know, in the bounds of modern publishing, a crime novel is sort of 90 to 110,000 words. But Agatha Christie's average word length is like 55 to 60. So, you know, there's already a little bit when you're sort of writing in this space, there's a little bit of you're going longer than, than she was. And so, you know, the predictability, you have to really watch that and manage it. Um, I think the key is, again, it's revealing it at the right time where you feel like people may not have got ahead of you. Um, most people will sort of get it about 
five pages from the actual time you name them because you're eliminating suspects one by one and there's nothing left. But I also believe that Playfair Mysteries are like Sudoku puzzles and our job as writers is to have it be allowable that you can solve the crime. Five to 10% of people should be able to figure out the end of the mystery to every mystery novel ever written. Otherwise, it's not a good enough mystery novel. You haven't given us enough. It's playing a Sudoku puzzle without a couple of the numbers and then you're just stuck. And so if it becomes guesswork, then I don't think it's a fun mystery. If you solve it, but I can satisfy you that, oh, I see what he did here. Oh, that's clever. I did know who done it, but I didn't know why. I didn't know why done it, but I didn't know who. Then I think we've done our job as, as crime writers. I think um, when, when I do these sort of things and people come say, oh, red, no trace, well, the first question I ask is, did you pick it? And 90% of people have said no. The only time someone's told me they did was at a book club thing. They'd already they'd all read the book, which was great, which meant we could discuss the book and we could discuss all the red herrings and things without any spoilers because everyone there knew that we were going to be talking about the book. And the only person who said that she picked it quite early on, she said, I picked it very early on, but to be fair, I read a lot of crime novels and a lot of murder mysteries and a lot of things. So I sort of know what to look for. So the fact that you introduced this character and said something about him, said, right, that's one to watch, and then I can sort of pick it out pretty quick from there. So to me, like, I, to me, it was just, it was obvious as I was writing it. Like, once I was, was working on it, I thought, this is too obvious. But then when my agent said, no, I didn't, I put it down to the last two people, which is sort of what I was trying to do anyway. I thought, well, okay, cool, that's, that's obviously worked. I've done something right here. But as I was writing things, it's like, oh, this is, is that too obvious? It's too, is this too obvious? Because you've got it in your head and you're trying to make it, like you say, you've got to make it fair, but not obvious. So it's it's really hard when you, because to you it's obvious because you know what it's going to be. So There's a difference between a gotcha moment and an ah moment. Mm. And I think that's the real key for every crime writer. And if, if you go for a gotcha moment, I think maybe it's satisfying in the immediacy of kind of, ah, yes, check cha But it's not satisfying for me. It's not satisfying in a novel. And I think... I'd be like, wow, that was a big twist. And then you put it down and then an hour later, you're like, that didn't make no, didn't any make sense. <laughs> and that's the difference. And if you, if you don't, if you go for the R ah moment, then some people are going to figure it out because you've played fair with them. You put it all on the table. I mean, you guys, I've done the radio show with you guys before and you guys are phenomenal at picking stuff. You know, oh, you're all over it. You're like, you. the influence is here, which means this comes from here and then this follows the rule. And I'm just like, shut up, guys. <laughs> Um, I've had a similar reader um, feedback experience in that most readers say um, they didn't pick the um, twist. And then I've had a, a similar experience with these two in that these are the only ones that, that did pick um, the twist. So I think, it, yeah, it does come down to maybe perhaps how much you read and, and analyse readings. Um, but if we talk about um, planning and, you know, when to reveal um, who done it, um, I am a planner in the planning and pantsing scale, but th a lot of things happen and things change. So um, the um, baddie, if you like, is revealed um, quite early and um, people can really almost settle back and just watch that baddie, um, the mayhem unravel. Um, and after I'd finished the book and I'd submitted it to some prizes and got some great feedback and, and, and so on, only after it was, I, th I thought, finished, um, did I develop this twist where something additional and surprising happened? Um, so I guess that's an observation about this um, planning and, and pantsing range that we have and how much you can yeah, try to um, decide when you're going to reveal something and um, how that might change when you're actually working on the book and it can change quite I, late. I didn't, pick, I didn't it. pick yours at all, but the moment it happened, I'm like, Oh, of course. Yeah. oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, that, make, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's, um, that's messed up, but that, that <laughs> makes sense, yeah. I'll also say, uh, you know, I strongly believe in my book. I, I don't think anybody could honestly say when they get to the end of the mystery that they could say, I figured out who the killer was, I figured out why they did it, and I figured out, and that is because I figured out every puzzle, anagram, <laughs> numerical <laughs> Uh, you know, arithmetic problem, all of the puzzles that are on the just, page. So just watch me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get them all? Because the, those kind of things are in the book for a reason to prop up those really kind of intellectualized close readers that 
are, go are going to try and figure it out and try and outpace you. But I don't think you can get to the end and be like, I knew the significance of every single one of these and this came through in every single one of these puzzles because there are, there are puzzles in the book, there are codes and stuff. And so that should prop the reader up as well. Can I, can I say, I'm not going to say that I solved everything about your book, but I did enjoy uh, the, the word puzzle that it appears very early on. And I enjoyed figuring out, let's say, the, the final act's uh, name, let's say. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed oh, yes. figuring that part out. Um, although a lot of the secondary mysteries kind of, I don't know, they just, they just fell out of my brain, I guess. Well, that's the point. That's the trick, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to put enough secondary mysteries in there that, you know, which mystery is in the current consciousness of your reader and which isn't. But, but, I but think... do you? Oh, Cause, oh, no. cause, cause here's the thing I'm going to pose is that that is, that is one solution that works well in a closed circle mystery, especially one where you have a very genre savvy character like Ernest. But when we look at Michael and Michelle's books, we actually tend to deal more with what I'd call the second book in, in mm. crime fiction, which is that when you spot the twist early, you jump into the second book where suddenly you're now reading with the knowledge of what you're looking at. You now are getting all of these cues that would have, been just subtle hints that you'd come back to another time but then now saying something completely different to you do you feel i guess michael i'll go to you do you feel like you have that reader in mind who did come to you and say that they picked it when you're dropping those clues in are you worried about that experience you were having of oh this is all getting a bit too obvious for me when you do have that knowledge as the author um i like i like it when people because so, quite a few people have read it twice and they said when I read it the second time knowing what was going to happen we could see how you dropped in those little the little hints so that if you do get the hints and you do pick it you sort of going to as you keep reading you'll probably just keep confirming that you are right but at the same time you've got to try and get them to go for that red herring too so there's sort of there's got to be both there's got to be proper hints and then uh, maybe false hints that could be the thing so like between the two characters at the end you can sort of decide who's it going to be it could have gone either way and as i said right up until the end it could have been either of them but i decided to go one way rather than the other and um yeah so it is it is nice when people say oh we could see we could see you leading us in one direction but also the other direction too we could we could have gone down both paths but when it comes to the reveal basically both paths end up coming to the same point um and yeah, it was just, I mean, I, would, I got asked by an interviewer a little while ago, I did an event with um, another Perth author. He said, what made you write a locked room mystery for your second book? Because they're quite involved and hard and most people don't um, really, you know, ta tackle them unless they've been around a while. And I said, well, that's the beauty of not knowing what you're doing. <laughs> I didn't know I was not supposed to do it. I didn't even know I'd written a thriller with wild dogs until my agent told me I was just writing a book where stuff happened a bit quicker. And yeah, so it's really, it's really, and I loved, I love, Ben's got a line in his book about the adverb, you know, what's an adverb? And I, had a, I had a manuscript assessment come back for my first book saying I, I missed quite a few prepositions. I thought, oh, sweet, cool. <laughs> What the hell is a preposition? <laughs> but I, I hated I hated English in the high school. I just did not. And so, yeah, no, no, I'd love to meet my old English teacher and say, hey, look at me now. Yeah. Woo. Well, I guess one of the other interesting things for you, Michelle, would have been that you added that twist after going through the main writing process, which yeah. also meant that for you as an author going back through your own book, you would have then had that same discovery process of going, oh, that's what this scene means now. And that's exactly what happened. Um, I, I realised, yeah, what maybe subconsciously I had been seeding it because it wasn't um, too much of a, a rewrite, for example, yeah, to, to add that um, twist. I think another element in the rush is that there are four character points of view and each of the four characters is going through their own turmoil and drama. They're all um, connected. Um, so that's something um, I think that, that keeps it um, being, um, there's a lot of, they each have their own red herrings. The, there's there's um, a game or cues and clues for um, each of them. And another thing, of course, that the reader is, expects is, or is looking forward to is all these four character stories um, coming together. That, is it going to um, mean it accumulates into you know one explosive event for all of them? Are they going to be cascading events? And wh who's resolved and, and when? Um, so I had a lot of fun with um, those storylines um, leaning on each other too. I think um, the second book theory is is such a great 
insight into how a lot of people read read crime fiction as well you know it does transform it when your perspective is on a specific angle and part of our job is the filtering of information in the anticipation of your attention and where it goes um for me one of the big things is taking that second book thing quite literally. So I'm really invested in the rereadability of a novel. You know, how do you make something rereadable when, you know, the whole thing is finding out the ending? But I think that really great crime novels, when you start them again, um, they sort of unveil this whole different story. And I think you can only get that through really delicate nuance of information filtering that applies a new relevance the second time you read it. So I've really, really tried that. In, uh, in both of my books. Yeah, I don't want to obviously derail things too much. We are the interviewers, but on, on our show, was that, was Death, of the Reader, joke? Death of the Reader, maybe. Uh, on Death of the Reader, the way that we cover books is that one of us reads the whole book before we cover the book and the other person reads the book as we're covering it, which is good fun. And that means that we can kind of have the experience of reading the book for the first time and the second time at the same time. What's the time going on there? And I, I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know. I just, thought that was fun. Um, I'm curious because... It is fun, and I love the conversation between you on the show <laughs> Thank you. as well, because one of you, and I, I, I can't remember, but I listened to an episode where you guys were doing that, and one of you was trying to pick the ending. It was none of our books. And one of you was so cocky, and the one who'd read it was like, oh, good, good thought. <laughs> Dead wrong, mate. Dead wrong. <laughs> I was probably the cocky one. I don't know. I mean, you do have, you do have an ego on you. Um, <laughs> Speaking of the social issues of our time, um, I'm curious, uh, M Michelle, your book obviously focuses on a very small cast. So all of your characters kind of have a, a very particular political slant in the way they interact with each other and, and bring the tension up. And as you know, crime fiction is a, a fantastic genre to tackle these questions around social issues, but because of the narrow focus of a, of a closed circle mystery, uh, these issues can make the culprit kind of stick out like a sore thumb, like the Chinaman, according to Ronald Knox's controversial rules. Uh, how do you balance representing the themes of your novel while keeping your criminal camouflage? Uh, I thought issues were important because uh, a lot of the characters are young people and issues matter to them, that, that they're characters. So, for example, Livia, the Brazilian backpacker, she is a climate change activist. It's part of her character. It's what it, it makes her interesting, uh, she, that she has that kind of uh, passion. Um, so it wasn't difficult, if you like, to um, bring an issue of climate change into the book. But as um, you're probably getting to, uh, it, it's a fine balance. You don't want to um, be didactic. You don't want to turn uh, readers off. Although the character of Livia herself, um, she is becoming so confident in her activism. She and um, advocating so much, she can't help urging people to you should read my blog <laughs> and so on. So she might be crossing that line um, a little bit herself. Um, but then there was a wider issue I wanted to uh, explore in the rush. And that was about just the nature of living in isolated um, communities, because that does fascinate me. Um, I've undertaken a lot of road trips myself. I didn't grow up in an isolated community. I grew up in a small uh, town. But so that's a that's something to explore that whole whole notion of how you may have to approach your life differently and have different habits when you're living outside the CBD, where, as you say, helicopters are falling from the sky <laughs> reception, uh, phone reception and so on um, is difficult. And when you put characters under the pump with a storm, um, it's even more difficult. So issues came quite naturally and added to this tension. The authorial distinction is so important in writing crime novels, because if you want to figure out how a crime novel ends, if you want to pick it, often all you have to do is figure out what the author is trying to say. Mm -hmm. So if you don't disguise the themes of your novel, um, even though it's not on the page, even though it's not the clues, but if your authorial point is too clear, then people will figure out your mystery too easily. Yeah, it would, wouldn't really have held weight if Haley, for example, was the heiress to big oil with <laughs> Livia in the car with her, you know? Surprise. <laughs> I loved, what I loved about the rule settings, and you, you'd highlight it so well, is when people not from that part of the world venture out there, quite often they'll go out there with stars in their eyes, they get halfway there and go, holy shit, where is everyone? Like, I've seen it that many times. We used to, I, when, I was, when I was still married out on a sheep station, 
we did tourism and they still do, my ex wife's still out there doing um, tourism with her family. And you see, and I, Gabion's only five hours from Perth, but it's through the off the beaten track sort of sort of thing. Like it's a jewel, it's like a bitumen road all the way out there mostly. But there's nothing on this road. And so we were, uh, we went touring a little while ago, I stopped at um, Payne's Fine, which is purely just an old mine site and a roadhouse and a caravan park. And that's it, it's a stop. So we stopped there for a quick drink and meal and whatever. And this truck had pulled in and it was a driver. I don't think he'd been in the country that long and his phone had blown up because he'd plugged it into the 24 volt charger. So he was out at Payne's Fine, 300 kilometres from Perth, with no phone, no reception. His fuel card was on his phone, so he couldn't. And this poor fellow was panicking because he couldn't get in touch with the boss. And I was like, where are you going? He said, Mount Magnet, which was another 300 k's away. Said, it's not far to, to me. It was not far. I said, you're fine, mate. You're bitching road all the way. Just keep driving. If you have trouble, pull over, put a hand out. Someone will stop for you. And he just couldn't get his head around that there was no cars on this road by his standards. And he was just freaking out. And I used to see that all the time. Tourists would come to the station. They'd just take one look at this horizon and go, oh, my God, what happens when something goes wrong? So deal with it. Like, you know, just sort it out. It's... I, I remember, Michael, you were telling me about, I don't know if this is in a book or if it was a real life thing. It sounded like a real life thing. Probably both. Where, probably both. <laughs> uh, that is how your books go, isn't it? Um, where, where somebody had broken down on the side of the road and, and somebody else zoomed past them, uh, you know, yeah. and didn't help them. And that's a, that's a black mark. You know, if you don't help someone in need out in the middle of, of, of relative nowhere, you know, that's, that's a sin against the community, right? Um, I, I think that's really interesting, bringing back this, this element of, of trust. Um, I'm curious, Michael, what you think about not just finding the people that you, that you distrust in these stories and these closed circle mysteries, but the importance of finding people that you do trust and that you can kind of rely on. Yeah, it's like, I um, mean, you know, Trace, Gabe's got Cameron, he's the mate who he's a lifelong friend, he's, he knows who's given him a job when no one else would sort of thing. So he knows he can trust Cameron um, and the two of them are trying to work out what the hell's going on. So it's you got to have both you do and you got to you go to these people that like you say you, you're not sure if you can trust or you definitely can't trust and then the ones that you can trust and i guess the trick is trying to maybe blur the lines a little bit with some of those characters so um and as as no trace moves along sort of each one reveals who they are and why they're there but it's only only towards the end of the book where that happens so that's when gabe's paranoia starts really kicking in and deciding that maybe something dodgy is going on and what's he going to do about it so yeah, I mean it's all these like, none of these none of these things I sort of did on purpose. I just sort of I, like like you said about you, we we read these books and we we imbibe them and they sort of come out in our own writing. Maybe not so much. I mean yours is very very much a conscious play by the rules. These are the rules. This is what happens on this page. This page and that. Yeah, but you're still figuring it out as you go. Yeah, along. yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm sort of doing it subconsciously, um, maybe, and there's certainly. I mean, I didn't really have much plan of what the story was going to be about when I was writing. So it was a, it was an interesting process to go through this. I trust. I think, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the other th interesting thing about trust is that it's used in a lot of senses to create fear. And one of the ways that fear most interestingly presents itself in your books is that, Michelle, you have a book that is all about fear that very much shies away from violence, whereas, Ben, you are terrible. <laughs> awful and atrocious about making your books as hilariously violent as possible. Degloving. Degloving. I've, I've... <laughs> See, I don't think of them as that I don't think of them as that violent to be honest. I mean these are these are a real effort in making sure that the murders aren't violent. I mean, they happen on the page, but they're not particularly gory. But they're like but, they're, they're horror tropes, right? Yeah, well they want to they you, you want to make them interesting a murderer is only as good as their murder so in everyone in my family has killed someone the murderer uses an ancient persian torture technique mm -hmm. to kill people it's not particularly graphic on the page but it's an interesting mechanism and i think that's one of the keys of kind of golden age classic mystery fiction yeah as well so you know i think the events that happen are more bizarre than violent because what i'm going for is the kind of bizarre murder conundrum but of do, how did this impossible murder happen but yeah i'll take it i'll, I'll kill anybody i don't care if 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 they're how boring far away is me, the exit i know how, how do we get if out of here boring me they'll they'll die um <laughs> yeah but that's a good point i mean you know and i put i put poor urn through a lot his poor hand um <laughs> seems to get beat up in every book but um yeah that's a good point i think just I'll, i just wanted to revisit the trust thing i think is really interesting because the character 
that your main character trusts, the reader does not trust. Yes. <laughs> so it's kind of a delicate, delicate kind of thing. And what you really need is, in terms of trust, is you need someone who can be the reader's advocate. So somebody who can sort of say what the reader is thinking and feeling, and that flows through the text. And that's a character that they trust that maybe the narrator doesn't trust. It's a tricky thing. And Michelle, you just absolutely bullseye to this problem by just getting Matt to leave at the start of the story. <laughs> Get the most trustworthy person out of the way. <laughs> There's no one to rely on there. And one of the things I think with um, having that four um, points of view as well, all those, those four characters are at different stages um, of this thrill ride. And it, it's like you're on the audience of a horror movie and you know what's coming and you want to warn them because you've been at a different stage of the journey with another character. So you're shouting at the page or shouting at the screen. Don't trust that person, but yet they still are at that stage. So um, yeah, I had fun with that with the um, four alternating characters. Yeah. Now, before we go on, we're gonna open up for questions in about five minutes. So get your little brains thinking if you have anything to ask. Um, your little gray cells get them up <laughs> terrible excellent in any case yeah I, I was curious uh so michael in your book gabe is kind of untrustworthy because he's paranoid uh Ern is untrustworthy arguably because he's just not as competent as we'd like him to be but michelle you have these alternating points of view there's a sense that you can't really trust anybody i mean arguably Haley is maybe out protagonist detective maybe sort any, of any but of them could betray us at any moment yeah, they could they could rip off their their face mask and tell us that they're the criminal at any moment so i guess how do you how are you kind of thinking about that putting these different perspectives in um do you think it's important that we be able to suspect our protagonist of of crime um i i guess it's a, a little different again in the rush um although we have um the characters are, are looking for who to trust for the most part from the reader's perspective i think there's a, a lot of trust in, in those um points of view they they trust that um oh gosh this is so hard with them spoilers <laughs> that okay, um for the most part yeah thank you they do for the most part readers of the rush um do trust the the characters that they're following that they see them walking through um minefields um of course there are you know secondary characters that have questionable uh trust um at towards the end of the book there's such a frenetic level of danger and activity that you they really have less choices when it comes to trust as well and again because it's so isolated there's very few people to lean on they're just latching on and, and throwing um trust um to each other and hoping for the best at the end yeah i mean speaking of uh, trusting protagonists in your first novel benjamin in the everyone series you very kindly uh you know, gave away the fact that Ernest was going to perhaps kill someone in the title of the book. Um, and that also means that you're then playing with, for the rest of this series, this idea that Ernest is not the perfect detective. He could betray the reader at any moment. And the fact that he is playing so much with the rules means that when he eventually does break them hard line, you know, we've done it softly at many points because that's part of the fun of rules in the first place. I mean, is that sort of Damocles hanging over your head that eventually at some point Ernest has to betray himself? No, not not really, but that's a good that's a good thought. I mean, everyone in my family has killed someone is is the idea behind that was to do what the title says on the tin, right? Um, each chapter is each section is structured around a family member, and you as the reader know that in that section the family member that's profiled will commit a killing. Um and then as it goes through, what then happens is you think, well, we've had these people's chapters and we haven't had these people's chapters. Maybe one of them is the overall serial killer, but maybe people kill more than once, you know, and who is Ernest going to kill? And those are kind of the central, central mysteries. But Ernest himself pledges to play fair um, as per the rules of the 1930s detective fiction, one of which is that the detective himself cannot be the killer. Um, so Ernest I'm open about he cannot be the killer, but I do want to play with your expectations. You know, who is he going to kill? What is the moral choice that he's going to make? And how is that going to pay off? And then in the second book, he sort of says again, he's he's obsessed with this rule. He says, I can't be the killer. I'm ruling out my girlfriend as a killer. Also, this book is first person, so I survive. So I, and I really had fun playing that because you're sort of thinking about, well, he had to sit down and write it and he sort of says in first person, but then how do I add genuine tension into whether or not 
Ernest does even survive this book and how do I play with that was really, really fun. So I take those rules and I commit to them. So it's not hanging over my head that I'm going to inevitably break them, but I want to push them as far as I can push them um, without, I don't want to write, you know, Roger Ackroyd. I'm not going to do that twist. So, uh, or Gone Girl or any of that. I'm not going to ever do that, but I want to be playful with it and have fun as I'm exploring that. I reckon your ears might have been burning as I was listening to that last chat. I was like, you son of a bitch. How did you, <laughs> you bastard. Oh. Something happens, you know, no spoilers. But no spoilers, um, yeah. I always say that the next one in the series is everyone who survives the last one. So I never want to be, you know, there were 10 family members and everyone in my family has killed someone. There's far less in this one. <laughs> well, there's a new cast of characters with some cameos. And then, you know, so I want to keep it. I want to keep genuine suspense in the pages with what can happen with the bounds of the physical object of a book that we're all sort of of this expectation of first person narrator must have sat down and wrote it how do i play with that all right well we're into the final 10 minutes does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask our panel stick your hand up and we have a microphone that will make its way around to you this is your moment this is your moment to shine there we go let's go uh yeah hi benjamin uh, just the golden the rules of the golden age of fiction why do you well what are they first do you want to quickly give us an overview but why do you find them so useful in terms of, of framing your own your own stories yeah i i think they're actually reasonably outdated so usefulness is sort of sort of the point um so when i sat down to write everyone in my family has killed someone i wanted to write sort of a traditional throwback mystery because the mysteries i was writing before this were quite dark and gritty getting ads for beyond blue etc so i wanted to change it up be a little light and i was looking into kind of the era and I discovered that Agatha Christie, G.K. Chesterton, everybody writing in the 30s, Conan Doyle was kind of before that, um, would meet up and have a detection club where they would have lunch and they would talk about how to write mysteries. And one of the members of this group, Ronald Knox, wrote down 10 rules for writing the perfect murder mystery. And I found the rules and I thought they were absolutely fascinating. And I thought that most modern psychological thrillers, not crime books, but the ones that fall in the psychological genre, were breaking them um, successfully. They're great books. But... I found that they were breaking them. So I sort of, and I found that I was breaking them, a lot of them myself. So I sort of set myself the challenge, right? If I take these 10 rules of golden age fiction, and there's heaps of these people uh, through the thirties, everybody wrote a set. SS Van Dyne wrote 20, you know, there's a bunch. Yeah, yeah. 20, 20 with appendices. 20 yeah. with A through F or whatever. See, look yeah. at these guys. Look, at, They know their stuff. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think the key thing to point out is that Ronald Knox made his rules about how to play fair in detective fiction. Yes. And everyone sort of lost interest in playing fair because at some point playing fair became so restrictive it was boring. Exactly. So, um, and Ronald Knox partly wrote these rules to sort of rub in Agatha Christie's face a little bit. She breaks most of them. So they're not... They're not like bona fide, this is how you write a crime novel, but they are a little challenge for myself when I found them. Can I write a crime novel like this and try to find them? So they weren't entirely a rod for my back, but I found it interesting to not be able to do things like the detective being the killer. Some of the rules are quite simple. You know, um, you can't introduce new science at the end of the book to help explain a murder. You can't have more than one secret passage, no identical twins unless you've telegraphed it first. These are all the kind of things that we feel as a reader. Um, and I thought, well, what does a book like this make me feel? And can I follow the, the questions without it being a rod for my back? Did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah. Do we have another question? Sue up the front. While the microphone's coming to you, the other thing I do love about Van Dyne's rules, which he quote at the front of the latest book, is that they were actually part of his uh, recovery from a cocaine addiction. Yep. He hated murder mystery fiction, and his, <laughs> his doctor said, well, if you hate it so much, why don't you give it a go yourself and see if that'll help you get over this whole cocaine thing? And wow. he wrote the, the most insufferable detective because of it, but you know. It seems to work. It's getting republished. I, I was oh, shocked good. to find out Van Dyne is getting republished. Can you guys read my next book before it goes to print and just give me all of these little gold <laughs> Absolutely. Facts because... Let's go. Put us in the book too. Sue. So, I will. Felix and uh, Felix and hurts. Ben. Yeah. Felix and Hertz. I'm just thinking about your last names and how to have like a a two person <laughs> killing team and, a, That'd be fantastic. and an anagram. Flick. A yeah. word puzzle with our names in it. You Flick, spoil us. Flick head. Flick head. That's sort of close in anagrams from your names. Close enough. Okay, I've got a challenge for you. There are other people who've come up with rules for crime fiction, the late, great Elmore Leonard. 
never describe the weather and the book should never be longer than 250 pages. Um, come up with a set of rules for Australian crime fiction. Would you come up with a set of rules? What would your rules be? I guess number one rule is entertainment. Uh, you do want to feel anxious. You, you might not enjoy feeling anxious at the time, but that's what you sign up for with a crime or a, or a thriller. Um, so yeah, rules are um, perhaps uncomfortable emotions. Um, but for me, where um, you draw a line and it doesn't drift into horror, for example, is that it, it's delicious as well. You, you are enjoying it. You're scared, um, but you've signed up for it. That's, that's a big rule, I suppose. Yeah, I think my rule for writing Australian crime fiction is to not overestimate everyone else's knowledge of what you're writing about. I think the beauty of a lot of outback crime novels is that we see a lot of things every day and then we put it on the page and international audiences go, holy, I think this is on radio, but you know, they say, I didn't know it was like this. I didn't know the outback was like this. It's, there's this certain fear is one word, but grandeur of the Australian settings anywhere, the desert, the coastline that is, people don't understand. It's why Swedish noir took off. So, you know, underestimate under, underestimate the audience's knowledge heaps you know take them back put things that you think are so Australian that we all know about them on the page and when they're on the page they absolutely sing I get emails from America saying I didn't know it snowed in Australia mm. you know people don't know our country and because they don't know it you can you can really kind of explore humanity in all these different places and what it can do to people and place so so well so that's that's what I'd put as the rule S Sydney Opera House is right next to Uluru isn't it yeah well I think <laughs> well I took my kangaroo here and um <laughs> I I was actually going to say Shane Maloney who who also had a bit of a stand-up thing the great Shane Maloney, when he was in, published in America, they had to put a glossary at the back. Hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so that might happen to you too. If, but if my Michael... books ever make America, I'll, I'm sure there'll be stand-up arguments because I know authors had to go through and change, like tomato sauce becomes ketchup and things like that. And I'm pretty sure because my books have quite a stereotypical Australian bushy character in it, there is no way Gabe's going to call it anything but dead horse or, you know, so, like, you know what I mean? Like that's, so that'll be interesting if the books ever make it to America and place having that. I can understand if they're set in America that where you would call it a trunk or a ketchup or, or sidewalk or, or whatever. But if they wanted to translate wild dogs to American, there will be some words, I'm sure of it. Well, they're probably not. They're going to pay me enough money. Although, yeah, I, well, call it what you do want. Do what you whatever. want. It's a hard conversation because it's so weird changing words in narrative description, but then not changing them in dialogue because Ernest wouldn't say that the GAN travels 1800 miles, but on the back cover, it says it's an 1800 mile GAN journey, but you do just sort of have to put it away and go, all right, there's lots of words that I didn't even know other people didn't have. You know, you just I've, assume. I've found the difference between WA and New South Wales because I'm a WA writer. I speak West Australian, <laughs> which apparently is a completely different language to over here because the amount of things my editor came back with, like um, I had a, where blue metal, he took off in a hurry and blue metal sprayed. And she said, what's blue metal? I said, um, it's blue metal. It's, it's the stuff that road is made out of, the tar and the blue metal. Oh, road base. Okay, if that's what you want to call it, but <laughs> we're calling it blue metal in this book because at WA, he would say blue metal and it's just a narrative description. Yeah. To, to some extent, there's no, there's no way you can save it. I remember I gave a copy of Solari Gentle's latest book, which is set in Boston to some friends who lived in Boston and they came back to me a couple of weeks later with a list of things that all of the Bostonites in that book had said that was wrong yeah. after it had been edited by a Bostonite. Yeah. So there's, yeah. there's just no winning. Palmy, Palmer, you know, uh, I mean, Western Australia, New South Wales do speak to, I haven't understood it. Words you've you said all night, like, you know. <laughs> That's why there are two of us here. He's translating. You say sure. about the miles, like, man, I come off farms and I also work with a boat builder. So between the farmers and the boat builders, feet and inches are still a thing because you, you don't buy an 18.3 metre boat, you buy a 60 foot boat. And the farmers are the same. It's a two inch pipe or it's a, it's not, it's not often 48 mil pipe, you buy a two inch pipe. So how much is left in the tank? Oh, about a foot. Like it's like I'm fluent in both. So when I've got these characters, especially um, Cameron and Gabe, who are the older generation, they still talk, they would still talk in a twenty foot like windmill length. It's about it's a, and and if a pilot, it's a hundred feet up in the air. And they had to come back say, what would they say a hundred feet? It's more like thirty three meters. And so, well, 
no one would say the plane's 33 metres in the air, it's 100 foot. Like that's, it's just that conversation about language and how it works and what's authentic and what's not and what makes something, sometimes something that is authentic would make no sense to 99% of the population. So you've got to have that balance. They also, um, Americans swear less than we do. I don't have particularly sweary books, but the Americans are like, gee, these characters swear a lot. And I'm like, gee, they swear not at all for the Australian audience. <laughs> We, we must know very different Americans. Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm very fortunate that the narrator for the audiobooks swears beautifully. Like, That's just, good. I said to Rick, where'd you learn to swear like that? He said, oh, I live in Sydney long enough and do what I do. And, yeah. Alrighty. Well, unless there is one more quick fire question, we've got, let's get the microphone up there. We have one minute. Let's go quick before well, they the, throw us out. I know, they'll kick us out of the circle. And then what will we do? This is a question for Ben. Um, I read recently that your uh, Everyone in My Family book is being adapted for television by HBO. It seemed to me that Ernie's character, the, the book really relies on Ernie's voice, in the first person I think you said, um, and presumably the next book is the same. I haven't read it yet. How is that going? And, and also I thought that Ernie after seeing you at the Sydney Writers Festival, I felt that Ernie was Benjamin Stevenson, the stand-up comedian. How is that all going to translate to an HBO television series? Yeah. Um, it, thanks for saying difficult. the phrase HBO so many times in that. Collect your 20 <laughs> bucks after the panel. Um, yes, so... The answer is twofold. One is I have absolutely no idea and once Hollywood buys the rights to something, they can do whatever the hell they want with it. Um, the team that we're making with are so great. That's why I chose to go with them. They're so collaborative and they're um, you know, open to me being involved in the creation of the show. We're still quite early days. So the form that it will take is up in the air in terms of do we have voiceover? Do we have proper fourth wall breaking turn to the camera house of cards style monologues or do we issue it all together and ride the wave of the script and try and get that in in dramatically elsewhere um but it is going to come down to Ernest. it's going to come down to who we get to play Ernest, and they're going to have to be able to do comedy and pathos and be pithy and meaningful at the same time so i'm very I'm as interested as you are in how that pans out. And I think there's so many amazing pathways that we could go with it. And I'm really excited to see what they do, but it is a challenge. You know, it's such an intimate book in, in Ernest's head. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the thing I've said to them is, I don't really mind how you do it, but it's gotta be fun. I think that, you know, I don't view my books as comedies. I view them as murder mysteries, but I view them as fun. So I never want to lose that. So whoever plays Ernest has to sort of capture that energy and, and, and bring that vibe. But, yeah, we're working away, and um, I wish I had a better answer for you. I wish uh, I knew. Um, but, you know, they people in film talk to you when you need to know something. <laughs> so I, I tend to get things at the end, which is great because I don't know what I'm doing and they're amazing and they made the Sopranos. I'm sure they'll do a good job, but I hear things at the end of the day. We're doing this. Great. Sounds good. All righty. My, my, my hope, just a, one, more, one more thing. My hope is that uh, you have like, you show the green screen of the car trundling along and you have all the background sort of stuff and the production in the film. I would really enjoy that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like actually kind of, Go full metal with it. Back. I would really enjoy that. Yeah. Anyway, I have I have a terrible nightmare about what we're actually <laughs> referencing there, but unfortunately we're out of time. Please join me in thanking our guests, Michelle Brack, Michael Trant, and Benjamin Stevenson for joining us today. <laughs> These three will be available to sign copies of their books opposite the library bookshop just outside this room. We're going to ask you to leave the room quickly at the end of the session as it needs to be cleared for the next one in here. If that's a problem for you, please speak to one of our volunteers. Thank you all for coming today and thank you for joining us for Death of the Reader.